Um, so this is uh, my thesis, a hydraulic analysis of the impact of the removal of impervious surfaces at base. And um, we shall begin. Uh, Pace Campus occupies land that was originally several estates over which uh, the decades was consolidated under one family. Um, over time, the population of the campus has grown along with a large commuter population. Parking space was needed to accommodate everyone, and parking lots have been built to handle this increase. Also, Pace has acquired the Briarcliff Campus uh, to offer more housing and administrative uh, Uh, this is, nobody's allowed to take any pictures here because this is top secret classified information, right, Bill? No, I've been, I've been presenting it all around campus. So you can, <laughs> oh, okay. You can basically <laughs> hand this out outside if you like. Okay, it. thank you. Uh, currently, there's a desire to move all of the Briarcliff campus to Pe Pleasantville, so the campus is being studied by itself in order to redefine itself as a more sustainable and holistic environment in which to live. Uh, some of the parking areas and one entrance would be changed and several new buildings or dormitories are proposed. Um, although the parking lot area is being changed somewhat, there's a basic net zero exchange of removed impermeable surfaces with what is proposed. And I was asked to look into the possibilities to minimize the effects of the proposed construction. Um, the campus is part of two watersheds, the Pecanico River on the left and the Sawmill River on the right, or, or west and east. Um, a watershed is defined as a natural unit of land upon which water from direct precipitation and snow melt collects in a surface channel and flows downhill to a common outlet in which the water enters another body, such as a stream, river, or wetland. Um, there's a divide at the top of Pace Mountain and all water to the west drains to the Botanico, and all water to the east drains to the soil mill. And this, and this report only covers the Botanico because all construction is taking place within that area. So wetland areas have been um, identified along the boundary areas of the Pace Pleasantville campus and uh, vary in size. The largest wetland is located north of the baseball field and field house, and there's another wetland found running along the western side of the parking lot of Miller Hall and Meinhard Hall, and smaller wetlands have been identified between Dyson Hall and the Deconic State Parkway. Um, this shows the drainage divides of the campus, and stormwater runoff on the campus flows principally in a westerly direction with approximately 85% flowing towards the Conic State Parkway and the Bacanico River watershed. The outstanding 15% of stormwater flows in an eastern direction toward Choke Lane and into the Sawmill River drainage. Um, and it, this shows that there are five distinct stormwater runoff areas on the Pace Campus, on the Pace Campus, pardon me, um, which discharges into the various wetlands. Uh, Uh, now, we just have to look at the news today to see the dramatic effects and the importance of managing stormwater. Flooding has become a huge issue um, here, and um, or flooding has become a huge issue, pardon me, obviously, in the Mississippi River. But here on the Pace campus, our meteorolo meteorological station um, recorded a six inch, 24 hour rain event in this, um, this past spring, uh, which is fairly remarkable uh, precipitation. So stormwater is an important component of the fresh water supply to the wetlands, and the flow from stormwater runoff from various land uses such as parking lots, walkways, rooftops, can absorb and transport many different pollutants and material into the wetlands threatening the water, uh, water quality and habitat. Um, the types of pollutants can include hydrocarbons, heavy metals, and uh, various refuse debris and garbage, in other words. Uh, the amount of pervious versus impervious surface in a watershed will have an effect on the first flush. Areas of impervious surfaces will create stormwater discharges of higher velocity, which are capable of moving a higher concentration and volume of contaminants. 
Parking lots and rooftops are two distinct areas where a first flush may occur. Parking lots and buildings are impervious and small in size relative to the overall watershed. And uh, effective best management, uh, pardon me, uh, parking lots and buildings are impervious and small in size relative to the overall watershed. Effective best management practices, or BMPs, include a design element which focus on the first flush and stormwater discharge. Um, the, U the United States EPA considers the best way to mitigate stormwater impacts from new developments is to use practices to store, treat, and infiltrate runoff on site before it can affect water bodies downstream. Innovative site design uh, that reduce imperviousness and smaller scale low impact development, known as LID, practices dispersed throughout a site are excellent ways to achieve the goals of reducing flows and improving water quality. And I'll discuss more about LID practices uh, later on. Okay, now for me, this is where the super fun of the thesis begins because um, I was introduced to this iHydro program, which helped me to quantify uh, the effects of stormwater runoff on campus. And this was really, um, it, it helped me to uh, reacquaint myself with GIS, as well as um, various aspects of analysis and things that I learned along in the program. And it really was a wonderful experience because I was able to contact the people up at ESF and um, even people in my own hometown who were in the, the tree service had experience with this. So it was really a, a super lot of fun, all done at my own uh, dining room table all by myself. But um, in order to quantify the effect of reducing impervious surface on campus, I used the iHydro program within iTrees. Uh, iTree is a state-of-the-art, peer-reviewed software suite designed by the United States um, Forest Service <coughs> and College of Environmental Science and Forestry at Syracuse University, along with other cooperating uh, institutions. The software within the suite provides for a comprehensive urban forest analysis tool, and iTree can be used to understand the local, tangible ecosystem services which trees provide from a single tree for an entire forest. So that's the incredible part about iTree is that you can actually, once everything is narrowed down and you have your model running, you can actually just take one tree, one parking lot, one area within a watershed and, and quantify it and see its effects on the whole overall watershed in terms of, of stream flow. And uh, it's really amazing because you, you, you see it graphically, which I'll demonstrate. Um, so iTree allows for effective management of the urban forest. iTree Hydro is the first uh, vegetation, iTree Hydro now, is the first vegetation specific urban hydrology model to date. It's designed to model the effects of changes in tree cover and impervious surfaces on stream flows and water quality. And so I used the iTree to simulate changes in stream flow and water quality uh, using impervious cover tree cover. So uh, one of the very first parts in getting all your information is you, you have to know GIS and it's a fairly involved um, procedure to get the information into iHydro, um, at least it was for me. Um, ArcGIS is a computer mapping program which was utilized for various aspects of the analytical portion of this work. In order to establish the initial parameters of the iTree hydro, um, hydrologic model, a clip digital elevation map was made with ArcGIS. Um, DEM data was downloaded from the USGS seamless website for the Botanico River watershed, and several manipulations within ArcGIS resulted in a DEM of the exact boundaries of the watershed, which was modeled. Further transformations Within GIS yielded the end product of the DEM clipped to the boundaries of the study watershed, projected in the proper UTM zone in meters, 
and convert it to a text file. Then uh, outside of the GIS, the file was converted to a DAT format for compatibility with iTree Hydro. Uh, the process took me many days, actually weeks, um, with repeated attempts to get the proper data in iHydro and uh, on several desperate phone calls to Peggy, sometimes late at night, she asked me to please contact everyone up at ESF. And I really felt like I was very close to getting it, and I tried and tried, and uh, eventually got it on my own. And when I did contact ESF in the end, uh, they said, well, really, uh, we just send everything out to a GIS expert. We couldn't really help you here. And I was like, all right, okay. You did it, though. I did. <laughs> and, um, or, so. Uh, GIS was also used to determine the square footage for each existing parking area. Uh, the proposed art parking area pardon me, was added to GIS via Google Earth, and the square footage was also calculated for those areas. So I'm going to just um, run through some of these slides because I actually have iHydro running and so that I can show you what it looks like. It's, it's much nicer inter interactively than the graphs that you can export it from it, but I will just show you that um, Quickly, the configuration of uh, you know some of these screenshots without having to go to the program. Um, the, the program itself relies on known stream gauging station flow data uh, and quantifiable watershed. So really, with I what that means is now is with iHydro, you have to use a watershed that they've already determined and qualified with data. And so what they what they do. Um, what is allowed is to find a watershed of comparable flow and characteristics um, to, to utilize that. And so Google Earth was used to establish that the, the Kisco River watershed was comparable to the Mechanico River watershed. Um, it was necessary to download two uh, KMZ files in vector format one from the EPA Waters website and the other file from iTree Tools uh, for stream gauge stations available in iHydro. Um, and once Google Earth was open, these files were downloaded and the areas of study were located. Google Earth is, is, a, is a remarkable tool uh, that, that uh, there's so much information on that in conjunction with the EPA. Um, also, Uh, there's also another program, iTree View, within um, iTree. iTree is the main program. And View gives you um, <coughs> cover attributes of, this, of the study water, uh, cover attributes of the watershed study area, um, such as tree cover, shrub cover, herbaceous cover, uh, impervious cover. And again, this is in conjunction with um, Google Earth, and you load it into the View program remarkable stuff. Um, so once all this was done, which it sounds, what did that take me, five minutes to, dis to discuss, but all of about three weeks and 10 hours a day, seven days a week to actually get done, you run this calibration, which um, will, uh, you, once you get uh, the proper data loaded into the model, there's an auto calibration that uh, allows you to see the fit. It gives you an automatic fit of your data with what's expected. And I must have run this dozens of times with nothing. And then this came through about one in the morning one day. And it's right with the Environmental Science and Forestry um, server. And it takes about 15 minutes to run. Uh, you know immediately when it doesn't run, that I can tell you. I have plenty of experience with that. Um, when all the appropriate data were collected, it was input into iTree Hydro to start the analysis. And the iTree Hydro model contains an auto calibration routine, as I discussed. Um, after the, the model is properly calibrated, tree and impervious cover parameters can be changed to illustrate the impact of stormwater on the stream flow and water quality. And models can be compared against the calibrated standard within the iTree program uh, to facilitate analysis on different scenarios. So, I don't know if you can see, unfortunately, this is the screenshots are very blurry. My model calibrated out of 0.79, and um, 
when that happened, I jumped for joy because they, they, they give you a list of 0.3 to 1.0 as a um, numbers to shoot for. And um, so I packaged everything up and sent it up to their IT people to see if everything uh, met their standards. And they said that um, coming in with this auto calibration at 0.7 million was just outstanding. And um, I was ready to roll. So, having gotten the approval, um, I'll, I'll see what we have here. Um, let me just go right to the iTree program. Uh, I do want you to take one look at this. These, these are the parameters you'll see when I go to the iTree program. But these are the parameters that I changed in, in my different scenarios. I ran scenarios of 5%, 10%, pardon me, 5%, 15%, and 25% and 50% reductions or additions on, on these. So you would have a reduction on the impervious cover and an addition on the herbaceous cover. Um, and uh, I, I chose that only because I don't, didn't think we were going to be adding trees uh, all that much to the, uh, to the area. So let me skip out of this um, here and go to this. Okay. So this is I Hydro running. Um, it's it's downloaded on my computer here. Um, I have several different projects. I already have the five percent open, but I have different projects listed here. You can see them uh, five percent. Um, 15 percent, 25, 50. I even ran a 5 versus 50 to see what would happen. And um, you, 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 I'll show you, you load your, the things that I just explained, the DEMs and stuff. Um, here, I've already, I know what my land, my watershed area is calculated through GIS. And you can, uh, these files are connected into uh, Google Earth. You get your stream data, your weather data. You plug those into the, the program here. The, the, what you, okay. Uh, so here's the initial setup. Um, you can see all of us name our Peggy Run. <laughs> I think that was done in the library tech. Um, DEM, the weather data, the stream data. And um, many of these numbers, well, um, the evergreen tree cover I got from iView, and uh, the percent of evergreen shrub cover I got from iView, and those are um, important because evergreens don't lose their leaves. And so they, they look at leaf area map index is another um, variable. So here, as I was showing in the other, um, Here's the impervious cover and the herbaceous cover. And uh, then they also have cover under trees. Uh, again, um, with impervious cover and herbaceous cover. And I changed those four variables to get all my, um, my data running. And again, I would just, um, uh, this is a 5% decrease over what the, uh, the model numbers were. 5% increase over model numbers. And once you got everything running, plug it in, you auto calibrate it. And actually, the auto calibration, you, if you ask me where any of these other numbers come from, they come from the auto calibration. I think with further knowledge and, and more intense hydrology experience, you can change these numbers to meet your model needs. Um, I didn't have, uh, I didn't feel I needed to do that. Because as I ran the numbers, this, this is uh, management versus the current scenario. So this tells me in a very um, compact way the differences between what my model was and, and um, what the scenario of 5% reduction was. So real quick, just looking at all the scrunched up numbers here, this clearly shows that you have an, a reduction in impervious flow. Um, pardon me. First, here's, this is the rainfall up here and the rainfall amounts. So you obviously have heavier rains in the spring and some heavier rains in the fall. Actually, the peak seems to be in the fall. And here, I 
like you can change the, the colors of the graphs. I won't do that because it, it research that you can change these colors and get things to stand out better. But um, let's see. You can also take all of these off, which I'll do just real quick to show you that um, I did not export all these reports in my, um, or I did part in my thesis, so that things would be clear. Um, and it was difficult to compare one to the other uh, without doing that. So really what, um, this is the total difference between um, the, the model impervious flow and, and what a 5% reduction would be. So obviously you have quite the, um, well, that, yes sir. So you got rainfall and blue. Rainfall and blue, yes. So, and the difference is going to be, except, I don't, is which, which line is, is, is the difference between the model? And the this model? is. The lower, the lower blue? Is the lower blue, which I can, I have the impervious flow here. Okay. And so, just to make it a little clearer. And so here, you have rainfall on this side, and you're reading the rainfall here. And um, this is the difference, again, between the model and what uh, my 5% scenario is here. And it's in, um, oh, pardon me, I can't, it's in meters cubed per hour. You can also change this to um, English units to get it uh, in something we Americans will understand. <laughs> Uh, cubic feet per hour. So, um, if I if I go back and I put the other numbers in, I just wanted to show because I know Josh was saying how um, in in my report it's a little difficult to um, to differentiate the lines, but you can if you need to look at a specific area and to really demonstrate that you're getting. Um, a difference in flows. I mean, this clearly demonstrates that you have an increase in base flow over the standard model and an increase in the overland flow as opposed to the model, as well as a decrease, a large decrease when you remove impervious surface by just 5%, a large decrease in impervious flow. Um, the other one that I'd like to show you is there's another one where you, you have both scenarios listed and uh, that can really become a mess if you're just looking at it like here. But again, um, if anybody has anything specific, I won't get too deeply into it um, because of time. But here, just for instance, in zooming in, you can see there's a lag time between the rain event and stream flow, which is, you know, most everything here is obviously expected uh, to happen. And you have all the concurrent reductions between what the model is, what is currently available, and my 5% reductions. Um, some of them, some of these numbers do not look to be too dramatic, but as you as you zoom in, your cubic feet per hour numbers change. And so, while this doesn't look like a large difference, uh, you're looking at about uh, you know, about not quite a um, hundred thousand cubic feet per hour in, in going past the can you know the whole for the whole watershed. So uh, they they are there, there is some significance to these um, events in the graphs. Um, and this is a five percent. This is still 5%. You want to, I mean, I can show you. We're looking at the difference between the light blue curve and the upper red curve there. We have the pointer. Yes. Right. Um, so the, that is the light blue and the red <laughs> is um, your base flow, I believe, right? <clears throat> and uh, so that, that's usually, is it base flow or is it? Yeah, it's base flow. It is, right? Yes. And that's generally where you found most of the. Uh, I, was, the I think what you're looking there is current impervious flow, the third from the bottom. That's line. right. I'm sorry. And then that under that's, that, that's where the largest. Right. Thing, this so is not, this is with or with, with and without 
uh, a reduction. So on the top, if you have no, no uh, pervious pavement or something, that would be the red, and then just 5% less, you get 100,000. That's the man, Correct. that's, that's the your suggestion. Yeah. Right. right, and then the base flow will flow later. The base um, flow is actually down in here, and again, yeah. as I say, it does not look like there's a large significant difference, but overall, as you know, if you zoom into it, it, it does become more uh, obvious that it's a, um, a measurable difference, obviously. So the water is being absorbed by the soil. And right. And there is health. an impact. The, the point that I'm trying to stress, I guess, is that, uh, and without looking at, uh, I don't think Pace is going to remove 50% of its impervious surface. By, by just pointing out a small 5% um, reduction in impervious surface has a definite impact on the whole Canada River watershed. We're um, using 5%, but what did the plan conclude? based on the plan that you were given, what was the change in the earlier surface? Um, well, the, it, would, it would matter, Bill, on what, if you decided to use the rest of the report about, um, you know, using porous pavement, yes. uh, permeable concrete, because it was a net zero, your parking zero. area was not right. changed. You're just using 5% to demonstrate the impact of a small difference. Of a small difference, and then um, the next part that I'll, I'll run through is, is talking about uh, using <coughs> different materials that can help in, in, in trying to get there. You would assume that if you went 5, 10, 15, sure. you know, that you would, it would be proportional? Sure. Okay. Yeah, and Maybe? I think if you, once I demonstrate this, this porous concrete, you'll see that um, you really can get um, a, by using different materials, you can get, achieve uh, some definite percentage of a decrease. Um, I would go here, right? Okay. So, um, so quickly again, it, we went over this, um, the different uh, aspects of iHydro, what it shows, it shows the base flow, the overland flow, and the impervious flow, and uh, the effects on, on the mechanical uh, watershed. And the most, one of the most important seen is the base flow. Um, it, it's uh, in, increased over all rain events and the peak flows lag behind the rain events, which makes uh, complete sense. And it showed clearly that um, the impervious flows decreased in correlation, a direct correlation with um, the reduction of impervious surfaces. Okay, so let me just catch up to my, my notes here. <clears throat> so now I wanted to talk about, um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the US EPA recommends uh, low impact development strategies to manage stormwater runoff, um, to increase stormwater infiltration and base flow, which is imperative to the health of surrounding wetlands and to water quality. Several ways to do this, which uh, incorporate uh, lid um, approaches are permeable pavement, and uh, traditional stormwater practices significantly reduce groundwater recharge and have led to a number of environmental concerns over the years. Um, as infiltration decreases, base flow and streams are decreased, and previous, previously flowing small streams often dry up. Um, one common factor between permeable pavement and porous pavement is the reservoir area underneath both of these store and infiltrate surface runoff um, and by using porous pavement it will significantly reduce the amount of land needed for traditional stormwater management measures. Porous pavement increases groundwater recharge, recharge and reduces uh, pollutant loads and stormwater runoff and helps alleviate flooding. Another um, in the I-Hydro, if you want to see it later, um, they do also the uh, contaminants. And it's a remarkable uh, amount of graphic data uh, on there. Uh, so one question about permeable pavement is how does it react in, um, in, in uh, cold weather, northeast? And there's been plenty of studies done, and it's, it's actually fine in the, uh, in the northeast in snow and ice conditions. Um, snow plowing 
can be used uh, as with other pavements and salt can be used but no sand. Um, porous asphalt has been found to work well in the cold climates because of the uh, increased ability of the porous pavement to um, infiltrate water. So melting snow does not puddle and refreeze, it goes right through the pavement, right through to the reservoir below. And pervious concrete, the same thing. I just want to, um, I've got to these, uh, here, hold on to these coming in here. Thank you. Those are for you. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. for an egg. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, I, I just find this, this is a, um, a piece of uh, per permeable concrete. And um, one thing be uh, between the permeable and, the, and the, the pavement and the concrete is you have a lot of uh, room in, uh, you know, there, there's less fines, they call it. So it's not as tightly wound. And the only difference between the two materials is this takes a little more uh, labor to put down. But remarkably enough, once you put it down, And that's all pouring right through there. So as you can see, the stuff does work. Um, also, the lighter color reduces heat island effect. So. And they do they do make uh, porous macat um, black top. White. No, black. Black. Yes. <laughs> so black, black. you got it. You don't think of that. That's well, it's black. It's black. I can't, I can't avoid that. Yeah, black. So um, I guess you could paint. Uh, the other um, very common around here are the permeable interlocking concrete pavers, and, and you get your infiltration uh, on the sides of uh, in between the joints there, because obviously they, I don't think they have a porous interlocking pavement. Okay, so these infiltration surfaces, which are the porous concrete, I went over the sub base is very, very important. A very deep, uh, two foot sub base. It, it, it helps as a retention and also infiltration helps in water quality. They perform well in cold climates, and the only real drawback is they need slightly more maintenance uh, to maintain their permeability. Another part of uh, lid design would be to add vegetated swales. Uh, wherever possible, uh, and that is yeah, the, the, the concept of um, low impact design is that these things work in conjunction with each other to uh, facilitate uh, reduced stormwater runoff. And also bioretention areas, which you see in many, you know, the parking lots now, just simple uh, grassy tree structures in between uh, the parking spaces, and they can have some beautiful designs. Uh, with that, which uh, I can. Now here, you know, Bill, I included this because way back when there was a, a discussion about this, um, and it um, seems like a great concept of the green roof of uh, playing fields on top of parking garages, but also green roofs. So mostly I talked about removing parking surfaces, but in order to try to get that 5% reduction, um, anything that can be done as far as a green roof or, or um, rain gardens with the new buildings um, would also add to that that um, reduction. So um, in conclusion, a uh, further study using other components of iTree is strongly recommended. It's really an exciting program that um, I think any other master students looking for a thesis here would, would uh, really love doing because it, it, it's very interesting. And a comprehensive forest management plan for Pace University campus would benefit any future master plan, which I don't know if it's been done, but boy, another student could really tuck into that with a, a lot of success. And um, with the current proposal of the Pace campus renovation to remove parts of the parking area, now is an advantageous time to design passive and integrative stormwater measures. Um, the 5% decrease uh, I-Tree Hydro model in impervious surfaces demonstrated that there be an increase in base flow uh, with a corresponding decrease in impervious flow. The planning of the new campus design should include the use of low impact design elements such as permeable pavement for parking lots, pervious concrete for walkways, and green roofs for new dormitories. 
Uh, the current proposal is to remove some existing impermeable surface parking lots and making the area into green space, uh, thereby increasing permeable area. However, there is an additional new parking areas proposed, and these should be constructed uh, using per permeable pavement so that the target of, of a 5% uh, reduction in impervious surfaces can be achieved. Um, in conjunction with any paved parking area, bioretention pond should be constructed. And, um, Combined with other elements of lid design for the Pace University Pleasantville campus, a reduction of stormwater runoff into the Pacantico River watershed is a positive goal of the new master plan. And I believe that's it. Thank you.